thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So when James walked in on the first day of my philosophy class, he seemed to be trying to make his six foot seven, 300 pound frame as small as possible. He hunched his shoulders, he pulled his arms and legs as tightly into the desk space as possible, and he avoided all eye contact with me and the other 14 students in the class. Weeks went by before I heard the sound of his voice, and then it was only privately after class one day when he confided in me that it had been decades since he had been in a classroom and he was terrified about this new experience. But it wasn't just the decades outside of the classroom that had robbed James of his self-confidence. It's also that these years had been spent in one of the most unforgiving places in the United States, a maximum security men's prison in, um, in Illinois. The very same place where James was right now reading and writing about Plato, Dostoevsky, and John Stuart Mill. James was enrolled in a class I was teaching at Stateville Correctional Center in Crest Hill, Illinois, where we would gather for three hours every week to discuss a range of philosophical questions, both old and new. I'm a philosophy professor at Northwestern, and I've also been teaching in prisons and jails for the past six years. I learned about the value of education at an early age. As a young child, I spent hours playing with my sister while my mom sat through classes and exams at our local community college. She was a single mother working multiple jobs and raising three children entirely on her own. Yet she filled our kitchen with conversations about the works of Freud and Jane Austen and Virginia Woolf and Thomas Hardy. I saw her give up sleep to obtain an associate and then a bachelor's degree, and I watched as she navigated a world ill-equipped and often hostile to single mothers with superhero levels of wisdom and courage. These early years burned into my mind a single fact about education. It is uniquely empowering. As I became an adult, I was determined to bring this power to others, and so I became a teacher. And that's how I found myself in a windowless, cement-floored room at Stateville. As the weeks turned into months, I saw James begin to lift his head, to look at his classmates squarely in the face, and even to occasionally raise his hand and share his thoughts with us. Near the middle of the term, I invited one of my colleagues at Northwestern, the award-winning journalist and writer Alex Kotlowitz, to lead a nonfiction writing workshop in my class. My thought was that some of the most empowering tools we could offer the students would be the skills to tell their own stories. During the workshop, the students were asked to do a simple in-class exercise. Describe a memorable moment in your cells. After 20 minutes of writing, the students shared what they had written with the group. One discussed battling a roach infestation, another talked about compulsively cleaning his cell, and still another talked about the profoundly isolating nature of incarceration. But all of them revealed a distinctive, compelling voice. Indeed, what they wrote was so powerful that Alex and I continued to work with the students over the next 10 months. The pieces went through more rounds of revision than I could track. But when they were done, five pieces were chosen for publication in The New Yorker, and eight were turned into a podcast by WBEZ. The essay that James wrote was chosen for both of these. By the time I had heard this, I had an entirely new group of students, and so I had to deliver the news to the cell house. <clears throat> When I went to go tell James, he initially seemed puzzled, as though his brain had somehow forgotten how to process news that was celebratory. <clears throat> I was really impatient, and so I reached through the bars and grabbed his arm and said, James, this is the New Yorker. Most of us would give up our first you know, firstborn for a publication in there. <laughs> you know, after this slight exaggeration, he finally seemed to get it. People on the outside were listening to him. His experiences and his ideas were being heard far beyond the walls of the prison where he had spent the bulk of his adult life. 
And with his towering frame completely upright, he flashed a smile that unequivocally conveyed accomplishment. In my five years or six years of teaching in prisons, I've seen many students like James undergo a radical transformation in the classroom. But why does this happen? Why does reading philosophy and poetry and history change people behind bars in such deep and profound ways? One answer lies in what I call the prison education paradox. Prisons are in some of the darkest corners of our society, and yet despite, and sometimes even because of this, the brightest lights shine in these classrooms. So the first strand of the prison education paradox is that prisons are shockingly dehumanizing spaces, but education is deeply humanizing. So life behind bars involves handcuffs, leg cuffs, strip searches, restraints, and cages. People who are incarcerated are known by their numbers and their cell houses. They are referred to as inmates or criminals, stigmatizing labels associated with being dangerous, dishonest, disreputable. Their identity is often reduced to the crime that they're, committed, uh, that they're convicted of committing. You're a murderer, you're a rapist, you're a drug dealer. The cells where they spend the majority of the hours in a day, every day, are just large enough for bunk beds, a sink with a, um, next to a toilet, and a couple of property boxes. If both cellmates stand up at the same time, they are quite literally bumping into one another. <clears throat> there are no curtains or doors, so the most private aspects of their lives are on full display. They are often exposed to extreme heat and cold, plagued by infestations of cockroaches or rodents, and victimized by brutal acts of violence. My own students are allowed in the yard twice a week. And for many of them, my class time conflicts with their yard time. So this means that they forfeit sunshine and fresh air for the, work, for the week to talk about the nature of morality. But the reason they do so is simple. The classroom is the one space in a prison where you're a person rather than a prisoner. <clears throat> so there's empirical work that shows the power of the classroom. Educational opportunities behind bars enable incarcerated men and women to live more meaningful lives, to feel more human, and to have higher self-esteem. Prison education has also been shown to break down racial and ethnic barriers that are often a cause of tension and violence in prison, significantly improving interpersonal relationships. But there's also the evidence staring you in the face as a prison educator. When you connect with a person's mind over the power of an idea, it becomes impossible to deny their humanity. So two of my students, whom I'll call David and Frank, were formerly leaders of the white supremacist gang in the prison. After decades of interracial violence, both inside and outside of the prison, they now found themselves in my classroom <clears throat> with 15 other students, all of whom were African American or Latino. In the beginning, relations were chilly at best, but thick with tension at worst. While David and Frank sat up in one corner of the classroom, away from everybody else, the other students were very careful to claim their own separate space. But just a couple of weeks into the quarter, David and Frank were not only sitting next to their classes, their classmates, they were swapping drafts of papers and trading jokes. By the end, they were all debating Michelle Alexander's thesis that mass incarceration is the new Jim Crow. <clears throat> Her view that the criminal justice system has become the latest means of subjugating people of color to social domination. David and Frank pushed back against her analysis. They argued that the major explanation of the current state of incarceration in the United States is economic. It's poverty that leads to prisons, not racism. Nevertheless, the simple fact that they were able to test their account 
of what had wreaked such havoc in their lives by subjecting it to challenges from their classmates revealed how deeply they were all being shaped by the life of the mind. The second strand of the prison education paradox is that prisons are places of almost complete stagnation, but education is deeply transformative. So we hear talk of letting people rot behind bars, a sentiment that was put into practice as our penal systems moved increasingly toward punitive policies and practices in the 70s and 80s and away from ones that are rehabilitative. Programming of all sorts was slashed in the mid-90s, with college and prison programs suffering some of the harshest consequences. <clears throat> Oops. So in 1994, Congress passed the federal crime bill denying Pell Grants to people who are incarcerated. And the result was devastating. Where 350 prisons offered post-secondary educational opportunities in the early 1990s in the United States, the number had dropped to 12 just a decade later. <clears throat> this left millions of people sitting in cells all day, every day, for years, sometimes decades on end. While things on the outside change, many on the inside are frozen in time and space, cut off from dramatic shifts in our social landscape. Many of my students have never been on the internet, talked on a cell phone, or even used a computer. So all of the work they do in our classes is handwritten. <clears throat> but while prisons are places of stagnation, education is transformative. So education has been shown over and over and over again to be the most effective way of positively intervening in the criminal justice system. A Bureau of Justice statistics study shows quite high rates of recidiv recidivism. 76.6% of released prisoners are rearrested within the first five years of release. But for those who participate in um, post-secondary educational opportunities while they're incarcerated, the numbers are dramatically lower. <clears throat> so 14% for those who earn an associate degree, 5.6% for those who obtain a bachelor's degree, and 0% for those who get a master's degree. <clears throat> And there is a significant reduction in violence and disciplinary infractions for those who participate in prison, and ed prison education programs. <clears throat> a study in Indiana, for instance, found that there were 75% fewer infractions from those, uh, from those people who were in prison education programs than for those who were not. Such transformations often begin with a new sense of self and with what is possible. In the essay for admission to our program, the Northwestern Prison Education Program, one of our students, Andre, wrote this. As I sit here taking the first steps towards completing this application, I detect a familiar feeling in my gut, doubt, that old friend I've known so intimately in my life, asking, what gives you the audacity to believe you can obtain a Northwestern University education, or, even, or that you even deserve it after all you've done? Andre grew up in Evanston, but in the part of the city over which Northwestern cast what he called a demarcating shadow. His only interaction with the university was working as a dishwasher and a busboy at Sargent Dining Hall on campus for minimum wage. Andre's last memory of the outside world was being led out of that dining hall in handcuffs by two Evanston police detectives, past a room of young faces filled with promise and direction. Now, decades later, Andre is himself enrolled in Northwestern classes at Stateville. That familiar feeling of doubt in his gut has given way to ones of hope and determination.
The third strand of the prison education paradox is that prisons are isolating, but education is community building, extending even beyond the walls of the prison. So prisons are removed from society, often occupying what is called the geography of nowhere. <clears throat> so here's an aerial shot of Stateville. <clears throat> this geography of nowhere has it that, so that both the spaces and the people who are incarcerated are invisible to most people. Voter disenfranchisement is widespread in prisons in the United States. Only two states, Maine and Vermont, allow prisoners to vote while they're incarcerated. So people who are incarcerated are quite literally denied a voice in the democratic process. Elected officials can ignore them and their concerns, while the US Census Bureau still counts incarcerated persons as residents of the location of the prisons rather than their home communities. This shifts representation in Congress away from towns and cities with urgent needs to communities that benefit from the jobs that make mass incarceration possible. <clears throat> Isolation is also a regular feature of life within the prison walls. More than 60, and this is, this is a low number, <laughs> it's de facto higher than this. More than 60,000 Americans are in solitary confinement, spending 22 to 24 hours in their cells per day. People who are incarcerated, who are isolated for this number of hours, sometimes for decades on end, are often driven to the brink of insanity. They experience delusions, engage in desperate acts of self-mutilation, and attempt suicide at alarming rates. So how do we bring people back from this geography of nowhere? If prisons are isolating, prison classrooms are not. Ideas demand to be shared, both in the classroom and out of it. So one of my students, William, spent much of his life on death row, <clears throat> where he was neighbors for a time with John Wayne Gacy. Yeah. I first met William because he did maintenance work in the back of my classroom. <clears throat> so he would come in to empty the trash. And he would linger in the back as he was getting really absorbed in the conversations. <clears throat> so as he would empty the trash, <clears throat> he would you know, um, start talking, ask if he could raise his hand, and he would stay in there before he was called out by a correctional officer. So one day after class, he stopped me, and he asked if he could have a course packet that I was using for the class and if he could submit the written work to me as we passed in the hall, taking the class by correspondence, so to speak, right? <clears throat> so after getting a course packet into his hands, I was stopped the following week by another person in the prison, and then another, and then another, and each of them asking me for the course packet. And after the term ended, my students began sharing their own course packets all over the prison, bringing me stacks of written work to grade, um, all handwritten, and asking me to read it and give it back to them, and they would sort of distribute it um, throughout the, the prison. And so what we see with this story is that the spread of knowledge cannot be contained, not even by prison walls. So studies show, for instance, that post-secondary prison education breaks the intergenerational cycle of poverty and incarceration, and so has a directly positive impact on the children of people who are in prison. Incarcerated parents who are in college classes not only provide a model of academic excellence for their children, they also develop skills and that enable them to connect with their families by helping with homework, by discussing educational goals, planning for the future, and so on. But perhaps the most unexpected dimension of the prison education paradox is that teachers often end up learning far more in the classroom than the students do. So I've been teaching philosophy for 20 years, and I've covered some of the same questions in my classes over and over again. Is the death penalty morally permissible? What is the nature of injustice? Is torture ever morally justified? And while I've had students raise compelling and insightful points about these topics over the years, nothing prepared me for, these, for discussing these issues with three students who had spent decades on death row, 
or two who had falsely confessed to murders they didn't commit, or two who had been tortured by police officers. My students at Stateville breathe new life into philosophical questions I've been asking for the entirety of my career. Abstract questions of morality and justice <clears throat> take on new urgency as concrete ones facing the very students entrusting me with their education. And this happens across disciplines and topics. A recent lecture at Stateville uh, that we organized on The Handmaid's Tale had the, at the prison had the students drawing parallels between the tightly controlled lives of the handmaids in Gilead and the domination they face as people who are incarcerated. A discussion of the Declaration of Independence at the prison led to the questions from many of the black incarcerated students regarding whether there is a place for them in that document. And a class on food production ended with a conversation on how to be ethical and healthy consumers from behind bars, where you have virtually no control over your diet and meal options. The Stateville classroom so transformed me that I have devoted much of the past six years of my life to prison education. I saw firsthand that we don't need more prisons, we need more and better classrooms. <clears throat> and so I founded and I'm now the director of the Northwestern Prison Education Program, which is the only program, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> which is the only program in the state of Illinois providing a degree granting, comprehensive liberal arts education to people who are incarcerated. <clears throat> so students in our program are right now taking chemistry and math, film writing and psychology Next quarter, they'll be taking statistics and literature and sociology. With the tools of books and pens and ideas, we are aiming to change the landscape of the criminal justice system in the state. There are several features of the Northwestern Prison Education Program that are worth highlighting. <clears throat> so first, students are admitted into the program through a rigorous admissions process that involves a text, an application that has a textual analysis, a personal statement, and requires then an in-person interview. On the basis of those, we offer admission to 20 students per year in the program. This is the first year that the Illinois Department of Corrections has allowed our admissions process to be statewide. So as Dan mentioned at the beginning, many of Illinois' prisons are hours away from Northwestern, so hours away from Evanston and Chicago, where all of our faculty members are coming from. So we are trying to set up a wing at Stateville Correctional Center, which is a maximum security prison, but where we bring students who are in medium security and minimum security prisons to Stateville for a Northwestern education. This is the first year where we currently have 10 medium security students housed at Stateville in our program. <clears throat> students take close to a full Northwestern load. So a, a full load at, on the Evanston and Chicago campuses would be three to four classes a quarter. They are currently taking three courses a quarter um, in the prison education program. <clears throat> we also offer courses that have combined uh, student populations. So this is the second year where we are offering an incredibly exciting law class that has 10, well this year 13, it was supposed to be capped at 10, 13 of our second and third year JD students who are taking a course on violence reduction and policy reform with our students at Stateville. So these are future prosecutors, these are future judges, these are future defense attorneys learning alongside some of the people that they will one day kind of be involved with in the criminal justice system. They've reported that it's been life-changing, that taking a class and having, you know, um, having students as peers in that environment who have experienced the criminal justice system, something that they've been learning about abstractly firsthand, has given them a completely new perspective on the law. <clears throat> we have workshops weekly, lectures, study halls, reading groups, we bring distinguished visitors to give lectures. We've done, um, our provost recently came and done a, did a book signing um, with the students. Alex Kotlowitz came and did a book signing of his recent book. 
<clears throat> we also have a partnership with the Cook County Department of Corrections where our graduate students are offering three to four courses per quarter in different divisions across the jail. And our future goals at this point are to expand to the women's prison. So we have already gotten um, an agreement. Logan is significantly further for us than Stateville is. Um, and so we are working on um, logistical issues. But we will be expanding to Logan. We will be expanding to minimum security facilities. And we are also working on having robust uh, wraparound reentry support for students who will get out. <clears throat> So the lesson I learned from my mother a long time ago, that education is uniquely empowering, <clears throat> I've learned all over again from a different angle at Stateville. Education changes people. It has brought new purpose to my life, and it has been transformative for my students. James, who entered my class trying to be invisible, has now been heard across the nation through his writing. So if you'll listen, I'll let his words tell you what's possible, even in prison. <clears throat> After a long day of landscaping work, I walked into the cell house and stood outside my cell, waiting for the gallery officer to let me in. Leaning against the bars, I noticed something moving in the back of the cell. I couldn't tell what it was because it was hiding behind the steel bunk bed. <clears throat> when the officer opened the door, I walked straight to the back and moved a laundry bag from the wall. To my surprise, it was a bird, a robin or wren, I'm not sure. I'm six feet seven and 300 pounds. And when the bird caught sight of me, it undoubtedly feared for its life. It scurried away, taking cover under the bunk bed. Its little legs moved so fast that it looked like the Roadrunner character. It found safety behind two gray property boxes. I couldn't help but laugh at its cartoonish ways. Oops. I lay down on the cold concrete floor and reached under the bed to grab it, but it hopped out of my reach. As I lay on the floor, it made its way to the front of the cell and jumped on a slot between the bars. It perched for a moment there. I sat up and admired its beauty. Its beak was bright yellow. Even its brown plumage amid all the prison gray seemed colorful. Sitting on the bars, it no longer seemed afraid. It barely moved, just its head swiveled from left to right and back again. It seemed so delicate. Its little black eyes were no longer looking at me. Instead, it appeared to be trying to figure out which direction to fly. I hoped it would find its way out of the building, so I waved my hand, shooing it toward the door, but it flew further into the cell house. For a few minutes, I felt like I was somewhere else. It was a small crack in a routine that sets my life every day. My encounter with the bird brought a rare moment of pure joy, and so I've held on to this small memory. 10 years later, it still makes me smile. Thank you so much, Jennifer. We're going to go ahead and open it up for questions now. Um, just a few things before we get started. Please do make sure to speak into the microphone so that everyone could hear. Please pose your question as a question and not a statement. And please be brief so that we can get to everyone in our short amount of time. Um, let's go ahead and get started right, right down front. Thank you for what you're doing. Are any other universities uh, seeking you out and working on this across the country? Yeah, so I've, I've visited a lot of prison education programs. Um, <clears throat> so there are a, a number of universities across the nation who have some version of a prison education program. One of the things that is unique about Northwestern, relatively unique, we're not the only person, but we're one of a few, is our emphasis on being degree granting. So many institutions understand the crisis of mass incarceration, 
understand that we have tremendous resources, especially a place like Northwestern, and understand that we are positioned to do something about this, that the data all shows that education is the most effective way of dealing with this. Um, but if I'm being honest, I think many institutions don't quite want to put their name behind the transcripts for people who are incarcerated. Um, I think that's at least part of the concern. We have found tremendous support at Northwestern. I'm proud to be a professor here. Um, and we have um, had a very good partnership with the Illinois Department of Corrections, with Northwestern, and we have also recently partnered with Oakton Community College. And so since Northwestern does not have an associate degree, we want our students to first, ex to first get an associate degree, both for students who might be released before they finish the program, but also so that we can kind of break up the educational goals for them. And so starting next year, we will be bringing in Oakton faculty to teach in our program as well, and probably the year after that, we'll confer our first associate degrees. Um, we have another question right down here. Well, thank you for, thank you for doing all this because it's very we, um, refreshing to see that somebody's thinking of them. What do you think um, the role of the higher education in the United States is to prevent incarceration by reaching the student before the fourth grade when we know they'll be incarcerated if they can't read? I'm sorry, so are you asking why do we not um, invest more prior to incarceration in education? Was what that do you think the role of higher education, the, of all of the universities, what do you think their roles are, the, their role is in reaching those students that are at fourth grade level can't read, is there a program that can get them before they get incarcerated? Absolutely, and there's a lot of work, I mean, you know, there's a lot of work being done to try to break the you know, school to prison pipeline and to try to meet people's educational needs before they end up um, incarcerated. Many of our students in the program are actively engaged in outreach to their home communities to say, I found this in my 30s and in my 40s after being incarcerated for decades, find it now while you're 16, right? So a lot of our students are extremely committed to um, bringing their educational opportunities to their home communities. I think sometimes people think that the work we're doing really is limited to the 20 students in our classroom and they have absolutely no idea how transformative this is for the communities. For young men in those communities primarily to see people who they once esteemed for doing things that weren't related to education now saying this is where your effort ought to be spent. Um, so certainly there, are, are, there is a lot of work being done on that. We're trying to come in at just a different stage of the process. Um, that needs to be done, but so too does this need to be done after incarceration. We have a question on the house, right? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, what is your feeling and what can be done about um, the fact that I'm reading that the prison authorities are censoring the books that you can use in the prisons, is that actually the case and what should be done? If I'm being completely honest, we have not had um, significant problems with the Illinois Department of Corrections censoring our materials. So we bring in massive quantities of educational materials per year. We're offering this, this year alone 20 courses. Um, we're offering a law class on uh, violence and re um, violence reduction, police brutality. We bring in readings about race. We bring in readings about incarceration. And we have not had that problem. But with that said, I do know that other prisons, uh, you know, Danville in particular, had an issue with censorship. And I know that um, lots of people in the state have mobilized around the Freedom to Learn campaign to ensure that we are able to bring in appropriate educational materials for our students. Are they doing that? Are, is, the, is IDOC responding to it? Yeah. Yes, my understanding is that they are. We've got a question right down here. Yes, uh, do you have to work with the staff, uh, you know, just sort of building on that question we just had, to get them sort of on board with the value of education for the prisoners, and are they accepting in that? I just sort of have a picture that may not be fair, that 
you know, the staff kind of wants to step on the prisoners and mm -hmm. kind of keep them locked up. And this would be sort of a service to help them get free. Yes, as with, I think, anywhere we are, um, there's a variety of people. And so my experience with um, the I, Illinois Department of Correction staff is that there are some correctional officers, some staff members, particularly a lot of our partners in Springfield are wholly on board. It's a win-win situation for everyone involved. Prison education programs really transform the community on the inside. Um, and um, we are providing this program completely free of charge to the state. So um, my experience is that many people are very happy that we're there. Um, but as with anything, we have particular individuals who would prefer that we not be there. Um, and so I think that we have roots deep enough in the, in the, in the system now. We've been there now for five, six years. Um, where some of those early bumps in the road um, are, have gotten smoothed out. But that doesn't mean that we don't encounter the occasional pers person who says, and I think it's you know, a question that we have to have a good answer for. Um, my children couldn't afford a Northwestern education. I couldn't afford a Northwestern education. Um, I can't even afford a non-Northwestern education. And why are you coming in here and providing um, people who are incarcerated with that kind of education. So we still get that question, and I think it's a question that we need to be able to engage with people on. We have a question. Thanks. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm curious about thinking about this in terms of scaling up. So I'm wondering um, if you're partnering with other universities to sort of uh, duplicate some of the things that you've done at Northwestern. There are plenty of other private colleges and universities that have funds and resources that could do this, but also thinking about uh, post-felony convictions, like are, is Northwestern doing more to consider and admit students who have felony convictions? Are, we, are you lobbying the state so that people get financial aid and support mm -hmm. who have felony convictions so that they can go to colleges and universities? Because 20 is amazing, but it would be great if we could do more for a lot Absolutely. of our Absolutely, and so one of our goals in the future, so um, we are already, I've already been meeting with people at Logan, we're gonna expand to the women's prison. <clears throat> and um, to the extent that we can continue to partner with local institutions so that you know we can still provide Northwestern courses, but like Oakton is going to be providing some of their courses so that they can get the Oakton associate degree, that's the model that we hope to have to be able to provide um, a degree granting you know, program in other facilities throughout the state. So certainly we do have aims of expansion, and we also um, have the goal of becoming a national model um, like, as I mentioned, a lot of prison education programs are just offering certificates. And so they have faculty members who go in, it's volunteer work, it's just on a, on a, on a Friday evening or a Saturday, and they print out a certificate that says, you completed this. And I am a big proponent of us putting our enormous institutional resources behind these programs. And so my big, you know, kind of, um, you know, emphasis when I talk about this, especially to other institutions that have prison education programs is be degree granting, be credit bearing. I mean, certificates are great and all, it's better than nothing, but we need to get to that place. As for, um, you know, kind of after release, what work are we doing? So we have a three-year um, project right now, um, expanding our program, and one of them is to focus on reentry. One of the reentry dimensions that we want to focus on is trying to get institutions to admit students from our program who are released tuition-free. So that is something that we want to work on. Let's go right over here. Thank you, this has been most interesting. Have you done anything seeking out found, private foundation grants so that this program could be extended across the country? Yes, we have, I can't say right now, but we um, are hopefully very close to getting a grant um, within the next couple of months. That will, I, I said that we have like a three year model of our expansion and we hope that um, some of the grant money that we might get will support that three year model 
um, that we hope, again, one of the things that we're looking at is to become a national model, particularly of an institution like Northwestern. Um, I think that a lot of institutions with Northwestern's profile have been hesitant to give out transcripts, to give out credit. And so we are really hoping to be a leader on that front. We have a question in the middle of the house. Do you currently have any uh, mechanism for young people, or not even young people, who might be interested in getting at this problem from your end, from the instructional and putting programs together as opposed to being participants in them and, and making space available for people who want to do this kind of work? Um, you mean so people who want to get involved in prison education, is that the question? Yes, that's correct. Absolutely. So we have all sorts of ways of getting involved in our program. So we have a robust uh, peer tutoring program. So twice a week for three hours each time, we, ship, we bring a whole bunch of Evanston undergraduates over and they do three hours of peer tutoring. So, and it's, we have a lot more tutors than we can bring, so it's something the undergraduates here are very excited about. Um, we have gotten very selective because we're offering chemistry and we're offering math this quarter. So we try to have only peer tutors who have those, those areas of expertise to come to on, on, um, during the study halls. We have um, enormous graduate involvement. So I have a graduate student advisory committee of 10 amazing interdisciplinary graduate students who do everything from manage our website to apply for grants, to bring speakers out, to running our study halls. Um, we have a faculty advisory committee. We have the Undergraduate Prison Education Partnership, which is a, an entirely undergraduate-run program here at um, Northwestern, where they bring speakers to raise awareness about incarceration, about prison education. So we have a lot of community involvement in the program. We've got a question right over here. Uh, my applause to you. It's uh, yeah. intriguing to listen to what you're doing. Uh, my question may be somewhat outside of your area of discipline, but uh, it, it was highlighted by this gentleman asking the question about the potential resentment staff may have. They can't afford what you're providing other people to do. But the, what came to my mind, have you had, do, do you feel any similarity or connection with homeless people to the body of homeless people versus prisoners? Here you have homeless people who are down and out, obviously uh, poverty stricken, mm -hmm. and yet didn't create any crime. Mm -hmm. And here you're providing the benefits that you've elucidated. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And I'm curious if you ever gave that any thought. Yes, I think that tackling homelessness is, should be a top priority of our society. It is something I don't think anyone should be homeless. I think that we should be investing enormous resources into dealing with homelessness. But I think so too should we be investing enormous resources into tackling incarceration. The United States is utterly unique in the way that we deal with criminal justice. And with the number of people, we are a world leader, I'm sure many of you know this, a world leader in incarceration and in the way that we handle crime. Um, and so these are really, I think, um, valuable places to invest our resources, but so too should we be investing in children and you know, K through eight education and secondary education and so on. I think that all of these can be things that we invest in side by side with one another. Uh, let's go right up here in the middle, if you don't mind passing that down. So the requirements to get into your program, would they be for people that have a life sentence or people that might be released? So um, we right now admit both. Um, we are aiming towards having a significant percentage of our student body have release dates, let's say within about seven years so that they can enter the program, get an associate degree, get a bachelor's degree, and then we can help them with re-entry. But um, I, my work, when I started this work, was with people 
who were primarily serving natural life sentences. And I have seen firsthand the way that it can be transformative for people who have lost all hope that they think that they have nothing left to live for. And so um, I've discussed with the Illinois Department of Corrections that people who serve natural life sentences in our program, after they graduate, we can hire them as tutors inside the facility to give them a place to use their resources as well. Um, um, so. The question towards the front of the house. Hi, Jennifer. Um, I just want to ask about, so it, when, when Andre said, I'm not sure, I don't know if I deserve this, and when you run into people in the prison that, that don't want you there because they resent that, you said you have to be able to, <clears throat> you mentioned needing to be able to um, engage with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how exactly do you engage with that? Because I, 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 I got into prison in 2015, and people would say that to me all the time. The CEOs would say it, other people would say it. People say it to me to this day. Um, and I still don't really know what to say. Like, I know that they're wrong economically. I know that they're wrong in terms of you know the recidivism numbers, but like some people don't care about any of that. They just, on a moral level, they feel like you, you, you just don't deserve this straight up. I'll, I'll pay more for it. I'll pay higher in taxes to keep you in prison, even though I know there's something that could help you. I, I, people will say that to your face. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering when someone, as, a, as, a, as someone who teaches in prison, but also as somebody who's a philosophy professor mm -hmm. on, on kind of a, an ethical and a moral level, right. what do you say when people say, I don't care about the money, I don't care about the recidivism, you don't deserve it? Yes, I mean, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> so, so the first thing I say when I get the question about like my, I can't afford a Northwestern education for my child or for me, is to say that I think post-secondary educational opportunities should be available to everyone in this country. And I do not think that anyone should be denied you know, a college education because they can't afford it. So I am not kind of saying like, well, this, th this population deserves it and this population doesn't. I think that everybody deserves a post-secondary educational opportunities. So that, I just wanna at least kind of get that kind of asymmetry put to the side. Um, then I focus on how prison education is a win-win-win for everybody. So along every dimension that matters to you, I should be able to tell you why you should want to invest in it. So one is, for every $1 spent on prison education, we say 4 to $5 on reincarceration rates. Um, for every you know, kind of bachelor's degree that we offer, recidivism rates go down. So I go along all the dimensions. But you raised the question that I think is really the one, like, you just don't deserve it. You took a life, and now you should rot, right? That's the view that some people have. And that is just going to come down to a fundamental ethical difference, right? That I think that you, even though you may be made a very, very, very serious mistake, you still are a human being, you still are a person, you still are a member of our society, and we ought to be um, engaged in finding you a path forward for re-entry into that society. And education is the most effective path for re-entry. I mean, we just have to look to other countries. Again, the United States is really unique here, right? I mean, just look to all Europe, you know, European countries. They don't have sentences like we have here, right? So all of their you know, kind of efforts are put into getting people out of prison and back into the communities eventually. We've got a question right here in the middle. One of the challenges of educators is success. And um, I would think that in this environment, you may run across perhaps an incarcerated person who ends up in isolation or solitary at the time they're in the midst of turning in some coursework for you. Do you, what is the percentage of success? Do, are, do students get in the way of themselves? Um, do you have failure in the same way you have in any classroom? So um, right now I can say that um, in our two years out, we have only lost one student, and it's because he was released from prison. So that was very good reason to lose him. He's on the outside now. Um, and so um, our, the classroom is just a sacred space in Stateville. The students, it is the thing they look forward to every single day. And so they are enormously protective of that space. 
I do worry that as w one of the questions asked, there might be some people in the facility who are not happy that we're there and not happy that the students are quite frankly becoming far more educated than many of the people who work there. And that's a source of tension. And so um, our students have to actually be 20 times more careful than other people in general population because one wrong move and they will be singled out for discipline. Um, and so it's an enormous burden. I, we have been trying to put um, resources into maintaining um, the program in the face of our students having a full Northwestern load in a maximum security prison while shouldering the burden of the weight of the program on them, right? I mean, they feel as though they have to be models for the program, and it's an enormous weight to bear. Um, but our students are incredible. And so far, only one student has left the program, and that's because he was released. But it takes a lot, I will say. It takes a lot for them to make it to the classroom every single day. It takes a lot. So we have time for just one last question. Um, and if you are interested in getting involved with Northwestern's prison education program, please do visit their website. We're gonna go right over here. Northwestern has an amazing law school and a lot of resources there. Is there any work in you partnering with them to use your class as um, justification for early release or parole with working with the law school? Yeah, so we have a very close working relationship with our law school. As I mentioned, we have for two years now partnered um, with the law school to offer a courses of this sort. We have also partnered, them when, partnered with them in various other ways. And so um, one of the goals of our three-year um, kind of you know, um, project is to deepen our relationship with the law school along some of the dimensions that you are talking about. Yep, so that's, I think, in the, in the plans for the next few years. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Jennifer. Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs>